Another warning of famine in Yemen. The United Nations says millions of people are at risk and billions of dollars is now required. So who will step in to help the people of Yemen? This is Inside Story. Hello and welcome to the program. I'm Peter Dobby. Yemen is heading towards large-scale starvation and could face the world's worst famine in decades. The UN's warning comes as malnutrition rates hit record highs after years of conflict. The world body estimates more than 16 million Yemenis could go hungry this year. Children are particularly affected, with 400,000 at risk of severe malnutrition. The UN has appealed for $3.8 billion to avert a catastrophe, but it says it's only got half of what's needed as of last year, and millions of people have not received any food at all. The Saudi military coalition has been fighting Houthi rebels since it launched its offensive to support Yemen's government in 2015. Well, Yemen remains the world's worst humanitarian crisis. 80% of the population is in need of urgent humanitarian assistance. Half a million Yemenis live in, quote, famine-like conditions, and five million more are just one step behind them. Nearly 64% of Yemen's internally displaced people lack a source of income and access to food. Poverty is widespread. Schools and hospitals are barely functioning, while tens of thousands have been killed in the conflict. OK, let's bring in our guests. In Aden, in Yemen, we have Riona Judge McCormack, spokeswoman for the Norwegian Refugee Council. In Stockholm, we have Afra Nasser, a Yemen researcher at Human Rights Watch. In London, we have Elizabeth Kendall, senior research fellow at Oxford University's Pembroke College. Uh, ladies, welcome to you all. Riona, in Aden, if I can come to you first. Why does the war in Yemen keep on going on for so many years now, almost off the radar? I would hope that it's not off the radar because I do think that aid organizations like our own have been raising the alarm for the last number of years now. So we've seen the situation here go from bad to worse and then unbelievably even worse than that again. Um, you'll have seen the warnings lately that Yemen is facing an imminent famine if something is not done urgently. And famine or no famine, the terrible reality is that people are already dying. We just don't know the numbers because it's so difficult to collect the data here. Um, and we're seeing uh, malnutrition stunting an entire population of children. The, the toll that this is taking on an entire country is very hard to get across. Uh, I hope that we are doing a good job of doing that. The families that we meet are paralyzed um, by the conflict continuing. Nobody can continue to rebuild their lives. People can't return home. We're seeing fishermen bond off the seas. We're seeing farmers bond off their lands. We're seeing homes hit again and again. We're seeing millions forced out of their homes. Millions, water networks, roads, schools, hospitals, all being attacked and damaged. And now we're in a situation where they say half of the population will go hungry this year. There's five million people on the brink of famine. That means the smallest shop could tip them over. Afra Nasser in Stockholm. Would it be as bad as it's been and perhaps as it's going to be if the country wasn't in effect in a bubble of sealed borders and sealed airspace? Yes. Um, I think even prior to the conflict, Yemen was uh, ranked as the poorest Arab nation for many, many years. So the conflict with, you know, it's current contacts uh, where Gulf countries surrounding Yemen are coming into the, this coalition, bombing uh, uh, Yemen for nearly six years now uh, while targeting civilian sites. It's absolutely having a terrible uh, impact on the civilian population. But I think it's very important to mention that um, the parties to the conflict have weaponized the uh, economy. That is really one of the main factors for the dire humanitarian situation on the ground. So in effect, or on the ground, you find the North Yemen and the South Yemen are not uh, dealing economically together with the same Yemeni currency. So 
the Yemeni currency that is produced in the south, you cannot use it in the north because of the split of the central bank in Yemen. So there are so many factors that are playing a major role in the dire humanitarian uh, crisis, but definitely the parties to the conflict have uh, shown systematic abusive practices that are contributing to this uh, system of suffering. Elizabeth Kendall in London is one of the big issues here. We're talking about this today because of another warning, basically saying the country is on the tipping point of famine. We could have said that a year ago or perhaps two years ago or even three years ago. But the reality is that despite the consequences of that, if we were able to say a state of famine now exists in the country. That would focus minds in the region and indeed around the world. But we can't say that because we can't pin down the data because the country's sealed. Yes, that's exactly the problem here. In fact, we're always hearing that Yemen's on the brink of famine, and yet it never seems to have an actual famine declared that would focus minds much more sharply. And the problem is that it's impossible to access the data required to actually declare a famine. Now, we have managed to stave off famine in the past by very generous funding, very generous aid before COVID in times when governments were still willing to give aid. But at the moment, we can't declare a famine because there's not enough data, although we can see that children, that civilians are starving, and at the same time, aid is being dramatically cut. It was astonishing to see at the beginning of March that the UN appeal for just under $4 billion didn't even reach half of its target. Now, understandably, countries around the world have other things to worry about. They have a pandemic at home. But if we could only get the data to declare a famine, I am sure countries would be more generous and, and, and would, it would be a wake-up call to the whole world. Coming back to Riona McCormack in Aden there. Riona, is there another unique aspect to the war in Yemen? And it's this. You've got three million internally displaced people. If it was, and I use the word hesitantly, a normal conflict in the Middle East, a big percentage of those three million wouldn't be internally displaced. They would be displaced across neighbouring borders. They would take their stories with them and they would make people feel very, very uncomfortable. So regionally, there would have to be a reaction. So in that regard, there's no strong momentum of a reaction here because those people aren't being made to feel awkward because they're not looking at pictures of hundreds of thousands, perhaps millions of people having to live in refugee camps across the border. It's a really interesting point that you raise. I mean, my organization is called the Norwegian Refugee Council and typically the people that we help are refugees. They fled to other countries in search of safety. Yemen is I wouldn't say unique because there's a similar situation at play in certain parts of Syria, but it is certainly abnormal, it's a good word, because we have 4 million people, 4 million out of a population of 30 million who have been displaced from their homes, which is a small word for a, an incredibly traumatic event. It means people have fled, often with no warning, often taking nothing with them. Um, but as you said, they fled to other parts of the country. And I think one of the striking things that I've seen here is how much Yemeni people have been helping each other. They have been seeing the needs. They have been sharing food with neighbours. They have been taking people in. There's one family that we talked to who um, were taken in by another family who themselves were living in a tattered tent, but they made room for this other family to come in. So Yemeni people themselves have shown incredible fortitude over the last six years of this escalated war. But they're at the end of their resources now. They are exhausted. Uh, money, the, the exchange rate against the dollar now is a quarter of it was what it was before the war. Food prices have doubled. Jobs have been lost in their thousands. People who formerly had steady incomes, regular jobs, respected jobs, are now out begging on the streets. I'm talking to my colleagues who are seeing them here in Aden on the streets. And we have these pockets of famine breaking out in three districts. I'm really glad that Elizabeth brought up some of the issues surrounding the difficulty in declaring a famine. It, basically, the, at, at any point, by the time famine is declared, it is already too late. The technical definition of famine means that there has to be a certain number of people 
already dying. We are saying we need to act now. This is the last opportunity we have to stave off mass scale famine in this country. It is already breaking out in three districts. There are already 50,000 people who are living in famine-like conditions. We cannot afford to wait. And Afra Nasser in Stockholm, does your heart sink in the way that I suspect Elizabeth's does when you, you realise or you have to engage with the reality about the aid budgets being cut around the world? I don't know what it's like in Sweden. I don't know how much Sweden contributes to the aid budget for Yemen, but in the UK, Boris Johnson's government in the past 24 hours confirming they are literally cutting in half what they are giving to Yemen, even if it could get there in the first place, half that money is simply not going to be on the table. Look, can I just follow up on some of the points that uh, the other speakers uh, mentioned? I think for me, it's, uh, it's, there is no use in just waiting for the famine to be declared. Uh, I think it's very important to take action now. We already have so many indicators. We already have a report after another after another about the violations and the abuse of international aid and what aid workers are experiencing of obstacles, harassment and other abuses. So I'm just wondering what the world, the international community is waiting for. Are they waiting for Yemenis to not like not be able to bury each other, to be as as skeleton as all the uh, the, the the little children that we see there their graphic images uh, dying and starving on camera like i'm i'm just i'm 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 running out of words it's just what what are we waiting for we've had so many reports where top u.n uh, humanitarian officials saying that we will see a famine that we've never seen before in the history before like what we will see in yemen so it's just, it's shocking, shocking. The moral responsibility of the international community, Sweden, the UK, the Gulf rich countries have a huge moral responsibility. The, the Yemenis' uh, livelihood have been targeted systematically under the conflict. Uh, the, the farmers, uh, the fishermen, um, uh, commercial trade, businesses, all of them have been completely targeted and shut down. So this is a man-made humanitarian disaster, and it's just shocking what, what the world are waiting for. Like, do they really want to see a complete fallout uh, famine in Yemen, and then they will take an action? It's just shocking. shocking. Elizabeth Kendall in London, are the aid agencies and are the people of Yemen maybe waiting for a touch of clarity here from countries that have got more leverage inside Yemen than other countries have got, and yet we have to offset that against the reality, which is that so many countries, they're not turning their back on Yemen, but they are turning away from Yemen. I think the reality is just as bad as Afra has described, but the reality for, for potential donor countries is that they do have their own concerns to worry about, and Yemen is just slipping down the agenda. We hate it, we think it's wrong, but you know, that is the reality. Now, what I might say is that if they cannot stump up the aid that's required, then at least they could stump up a bit more political will to solve the crisis in Yemen. Because, of course, no matter how much aid you throw at Yemen, it's not going to actually solve the underlying problems. It's a bit like trying to put out a wildfire with a bucket of water. You can keep the flames at bay, but ultimately, it's the war that needs to end. And everybody recognises that now. Okay. You actually have to, to stop the humanitarian crisis. You have to stop the war. OK, let me, if I can, boil that down into another kind of formulated question to Afra. Afra, you were nodding there listening to Elizabeth in London. Stopping the war in Yemen. Well, I want to say good luck with that one, because it seems to me you've basically got, you've got three conflicts. You've got the government in exile, You've got the Houthis and you've got people that want the southern half of the country to be independent. So you've got all the external actors who want to put it back to what it used to be five, six, seven years ago. But maybe that's not the best plan for Yemen in the first place. 
Yeah, yeah. The the other day I was thinking about this and tweeting like the Biden administration might be able to end the Saudi war in Yemen, but who will end the Houthi war on Yemenis? It's it's the the, the war has fragmented the country into so many pieces and and the Houthi uh, uh, military offensive on on uh, advance on Marib for example this is a major chapter of the Yemeni conflict even Iran is uh, reporting uh, there are reports coming from Irani uh, news websites how even Iran consider this as a, 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 a decisive battle in the conflict in Yemen so you have all these parties really playing a major role in how how this war will end and and what kind of Yemen we will see but it's very very important to uh, find any solution that will end uh, the humanitarian suffering on the ground and I think for the Biden administration and and even the UN there are so many UN envoys today um, trying to solve the, the conflict, but nothing has been translated into concrete steps today. We only see an escalation of violence, but there is no escalation of solutions. Uh, and this is what is missing. And for sure, without finding a political solution or an end to the conflict, we will never find uh, an end to the humanitarian uh, crisis. Riona in Aden, would you agree with that, that it's not so much at some level, at, at one level, I guess, a war in Yemen as a war on Yemen? And what Joe Biden, we've already t touched on this, what Joe Biden came up with on February the 4th is OK, but it maybe doesn't go beyond symbolism. What was really more effective was when the Trump administration said, we are stepping back from doing mid-air refueling in 2018. That had more of an impact on the people who were involved in the air campaigns over in the skies of Yemen. Yeah, the roots of this conflict are, are very complicated and do lie within Yemen to a large part. I mean, we talk about the escalation of the war starting six years ago when the Saudi-led coalition became involved, but the conflict had begun in other parts of the country many years before that. So it's definitely a local conflict, but it has also this involvement you've seen in the nature of the Saudi-led coalition and allegations that Iran has been supporting on Salah otherwise known as the Houthis. So the two parts are coming together. Um, and the question of whether there is a likelihood that this war can be brought to an end, I really don't think we have a choice. I don't think anybody wants a famine of historic proportions uh, on their hands. Um, and as Afra has pointed out, this is a man-made humanitarian crisis. There would be no famine warning in Yemen if it was not for this conflict. I think we saw a small glimmer of hope last year with the exchange of political prisoners, which was agreed, was the first positive step in a long time. It shows that there, there is some uh, consensus that can be built upon, um, and there are the efforts of the UN-led peace process that are doing uh, enormous work at the moment to try and bring uh, what is happening in Marib to the attention uh, of, of the international community. Uh, we are calling upon the UN Security Council to take an active role in this. We do believe that this war can be ended. We believe that the first step could be an immediate famine prevention ceasefire. And then there are all the steps in place to start with a negotiated political solution. A military solution has been tried for the last six war years of this war, and we have seen the absolutely dire consequences. Elizabeth Kendall in London. That kind of is a perfect portrait of all the negatives and all the variables here. We've seen the UN envoy recently in Tehran for two days and three nights. We don't know what came out of that conversation. So that's, that's a conduit of communication that is a requirement, because if you're going to have a peace process, the peace process has got to include all the people all the time. And on top of that, the United States basically needs to get the Saudis into a different place, surely, as well. So it needs to get Riyadh to accept that it's got to do a conjuring trick and go from being poacher to gamekeeper. Well, when you say conjuring trick, that really sums it up. We have a war that's being involved at three different levels now. We have the international level, that's the international community. We have the regional level, uh, in particular, Saudi Arabia, UAE, um, also, to some extent, Oman, and, of course, Iran. And then we also have the domestic level. And 
all of those levels need to be resolved in order for the conflict to be resolved. Ultimately, it's going to have to be up to the Yemeni people. One can peel away the different layers, the different international layers, uh, but still, the conflict was domestically generated and it will need to be domestically resolved. Now, that's, that's easier said than done, obviously. But before we launch in to criticise the Biden administration, because, as you say, it's very complex. As soon as one says, well, he, as long as he tackles Saudi, then the rest will then need to be tackled too. He can't do everything at once. Uh, what needs to happen is that a space is created via a ceasefire for all the different groups to be then dealt with, uh, to actually start to create the conditions for peace consultations. As Riona says, as Afra says, a ceasefire is absolutely imperative first to prevent starvation and famine, and then perhaps there'll be the space for peace talks. Afra in Stockholm, last word to you. Is there another aspect to this six years of death and destruction that presidents and prime ministers and UN ambassadors perhaps don't get. They like simple conflicts. They like countries invaded, we go in, we bomb, we pull out, back to the status quo. But the reality mm -hmm. is with Yemen, you've got more than 230,000 people dead, three million at mm -hmm. least displaced, two million who may be displaced in the coming few months from the Marib area, 3,000 children, dead. But they weren't killed by a bomb. They weren't killed by a bullet. They've lost their lives because hospitals are bombed, schools are bombed, roads are bombed, infrastructure is destroyed. And that's something that the peacemakers can't really get a handle on. I just wish uh, any actor uh, from the international community or the policymakers that are deciding, deciding what's happening in Yemen just to live one day in Yemen without electricity, without water, without having salary, without knowing where, when your next meal will come from where and how. It's just life has become unbearable for millions, millions of civilians. And I keep repeating, saying no justice, no peace. It's so important to stress on this fact. As, as uh, Elizabeth was talking about how we need a multidimensional uh, solution to the conflict, but I think it's also very important to listen to how Yemenis themselves see justice for them will eventually prevail. Uh, it's not only about the, the casualties and the human cost that are counted, but there are uncounted human costs in, in the conflict in Yemen. And it's very, very important to compensate all these victims and, and, and really without, without doing justice and, and achieving accountability, we will just continue being in a vicious cycle of violence. Riona Judge McCormack, very last point to you. In the next 30 seconds, if we are not to use the word famine because we can't, and it's maybe an irrelevance anyway to the reality on the ground, how do we focus minds on what's going on inside the country? This is a preventable catastrophe that has been unfolding in slow motion for years and is about to hit a point that will be difficult for the country to recover from and I think that will stain the conscience of the world for many years to come. Ladies, a thought-provoking conversation. Thank you so much for talking to us here on Inside Story. They were our guests. They were uh, Riona Judge McCormack, Afra Nasser and Elizabeth Kendall. And thank you too for watching. You can see the programme again anytime via the website aljazeera.com. And for further discussion, go to our Facebook page. That's facebook.com forward slash AJ Inside Story. You can also join the conversation on Twitter, our handle at AJ Inside Story. From me, Peter Dobby and everyone on the team here in Doha, thanks for watching. We will see you very soon for the moment. Bye-bye.